My very first contemplation of criminal behavior was trying to uh, put together a plan of getting away with murder. And I was going to kill my brother. I knew that every Sunday he'd jump on his bike and he'd head down the road to join up with some other fellas. And he loved that bike. And he used to tell me, you ever touch my bike, I'll kill you. So this Sunday morning, while he's working, I take his bike. I knew if I had provoked it just a little bit more that he would chase me. So I gave him a couple of kicks and took off on a dead run for a tree that was right beside my grandfather's barn. And it went up onto the roof. And on the opposite side of the barn, there were cutter rakes. And sure enough, he chased me up there, and as he uh, topped the edge of that roof, I kicked him off it. And he fell onto those rakes. Some court people came and got me. There are few more emotive words in the English language than psychopath, a clinical term for a condition that only recently has begun to be properly defined. It describes a dangerous pattern of behavior which, although it's been recognized for the best part of a century, is little understood. Every decade has produced its own particular brand of psychopaths, whose horrific crimes have defied any kind of rational explanation. Recent research into psychopathy in Britain and America is encouraging scientists to believe that they're close to discovering the root cause of the condition. Now we can literally look inside the mind of a murderer we can look inside the brains of psychopaths and begin to see things that nobody else has ever seen before. What the scientists are discovering suggests that psychopaths are born, not made, that their condition is the result of a specific malfunction of the brain. The complexity of psychopathy has made it difficult to treat, but now that could all change. I think the general public would characterize a psychopath as somebody who does really nasty things. And in fact, the public view of the psychopath is that he or she, primarily he, is a serial killer. The general public is not wrong in that respect, but what has happened is that they have ignored the fact that there are, there are tens of thousands of other people out there who are psychopaths but are not serial killers. Psychopaths simply do not experience emotions in the same way that we do. They don't experience empathy in the way that we do. They don't experience love in the way that we do. And because of this, they are more likely to stick a knife in someone to get what they want because they just don't care about the other person. I stabbed my first man. Um, I uh, stabbed him. Uh, he lived. But it sent out a word a clear word to the rest of them that uh, you don't want to be messing with this kid. He'll stick you. Psychopaths can sing the lyrics, but they don't respond to the melody, the melody of, of normal human interactions and emotions. There is something missing. He has no compunctions. He kisses or kills without a thought. They are dangerous without conscience, and all around us. In Britain, it is estimated that one in every 200 of the population is psychopathic. And by far the vast majority are neither criminal nor in prison. But the kind of harm that psychopaths can cause at home and in the workplace is deeply damaging and costly in every sense. We must be concerned about their impact on families when they're out in the community. They move from relationship to relationship. They have multiple children who they abandon. They engage in spousal assault and a whole range of behaviors which are 
unacceptable. David Cook is a forensic psychologist at the Douglas Inch Center in Glasgow. He's made a close study of psychopaths in prison. They tend to be very versatile in their criminality, so they don't tend to engage in one particular type of crime. They'll engage in a whole variety, so they may engage in violent crime, conning and manipulative crime, they may engage in sex crime, uh, property crime and so forth. So they, they, they cover the whole range of, of criminal behaviour. In the workplace, they often uh, disrupt and destroy the, the good working of uh, the business or an operation because they're interested in what's in it for themselves. I think it's a very important condition and we do need resources put into treatment to see if we can find anything that works. The only psychopaths who are readily available for possible treatment and research purposes are those who are locked up in prison. They're a minority of the prison population, but they're special. There is a growing realization that the range of their crimes, coupled with the disproportionate amount of damage they cause, makes them public enemy number one. The population in which you'd find a bigger concentration of psychopaths than anywhere else uh, is in, amongst convicted criminals. But a majority of the people in prison are not psychopaths. Psychopaths are a minority, but a minority who are particularly likely to reoffend. David Thornton is a senior scientist with Her Majesty's Prison Service. He develops treatment programs for serious offenders, and recidivist psychopaths are now a major concern of his. Further criminal behaviour harms the victims of that criminal behaviour. Um, it also um, costs the country a lot of money in terms of police time, in terms of the time of the courts, um, and in terms of what society spends in relation to people who've been hurt by crime. You only have to change reoffence rates by quite a small amount, and you actually save quite a lot of money if you're thinking of it in purely economic terms. Before you can tackle the high cost of psychopathic crime, first you must reliably identify who are the psychopaths. Recently, this has become easier. The major breakthrough, I think, has been the development of the psychopathy checklist by Robert Hare and his colleagues. And that has allowed uniformity in the diagnostic process. So when a researcher in Canada talks about a psychopath defined by Hare and one in Scotland, talks about psychopaths defined by Hare's criteria, we all know we're talking about the same sort of uh, disorder. In Vancouver, the person who has contributed most to helping everyone get a better handle on psychopathy is Robert Hare. From the start, Hare recognized the central problem of defining a condition about which we know little, other than its symptoms. If you're going to deal with a particular condition, called psychopathy in this case, or schizophrenia or any other condition, you've got to make sure that you can record and measure these particular disorders reliably and validly. From the scientific perspective, psychopathy is a combination of characteristics, inferred personality traits and behaviors that hang together. And for this reason, we had to figure out a way to make this, this idea of psychopathy as scientifically valid as possible. And we spent the next really 15 years trying to develop an instrument that would actually do this job, and in effect a measuring tool that was not made out of rubber. The measuring tool that Hare devised is called the Psychopathy Checklist. It's become the industry standard internationally for identifying psychopaths. In a carefully structured interview, an expert using the checklist, which defines character traits closely associated with psychopaths, can determine the extent to which someone is or is not psychopathic. Many of these characteristics are not uncommon, but points are awarded out of 40, and a score of 26 or higher is required to identify the true psychopath. Whenever I list the characteristics that define